Hey everyone, welcome to Studio Sunday. I hope you guys have had a good week, are staying healthy, avoiding large gatherings, wearing a mask, washing your hands, but most importantly, registered to vote. The presidential election is three months from tomorrow. Wow. Yes, every vote counts. Everybody get out there and vote. Vote by mail, however you need to vote. That's that's my political rant for today. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> that was a short speech. I know. Okay, in the studio this week, we had some challenges with the new How to Draw book. Mm. We received our copies from the printer, and the pages literally fell out when you opened the book. <laughs> they just came apart. Yeah, it turns out that lay flat also means fall flat. <laughs> Lay flat means take the paper out and lay it on the table. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it has a bad binding. It's not even a lay flat book. So we're probably going to go ahead and cancel the diamond order and resolicit it for December release so that we can get exactly what we want from the printer with no big rush job. Make them start over. Yeah. So, and we may change the cover color just a little so we know that they're not just giving us the same book back. Do we have a sample here? No, no, no we, sent them, we back. sent them all back. Yeah. yeah. So a few months to lay on that book. The good news is that we received Five Year Stalemate, the final trade of the Five Year series, and it'll be in our store next week and in comic book shops as well. So check that out. It's the last five series uh, issues of the series and the conclusion. So that's pretty exciting. It was for me to finish the story and. You know, finally get another one in the... That's great. Also, we're planning, just to get on your calendar, we're planning a year-end party. Um, and it's going to be October 23rd through the 25th, which is not exactly year-end. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, like summer uh, end. it's in October because you're going to have just finished ever your new graphic novel. And so we can celebrate that. Mm -hmm. And we can celebrate early the end of this freaking year. Man. Enough. Everybody wants it over. Yeah. So we're going to do that October 23rd through 25th. So uh, okay. stay tuned for information about all the fun things we're going to do. You're going to do some live panels and signings. And we'll have some art and sketches up in the store. And By live, you mean I get to talk to real people? You do. Huh. Somebody besides me. <laughs> Humanity. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> it's like the Twilight Zone. I, I, I think humanity is still out there, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So um, stay tuned for more information on that. We've got a couple of months before we'll get real serious about it, but it'll be a fun weekend. We'll do it on a Friday, Saturday, and half a day on Sunday or something like that. Um, so are you ready for the hot seat? Yeah, I am. Unless you have something more to add. No, I, because I've just been, you know, here drawing, so my brain has been living in a very small world. Doesn't it always? Yes. <laughs> Probably does. <laughs> so I don't have anything worldly to add unless you want to talk about my uh, fiction. Okay, well, let's get on the hot seat. Okay. Um, our first question is about timing. This is an interesting question. How do you decide how long to make a pivotal scene, add humor, change direction, in the story arc? That's, that's 30 questions, and they all have different answers. Uh, can, well, can you just talk about timing? Yeah. Timing is what makes the story so, so compelling. You know, the character makes it charming, but timing makes it compelling. Um, I think that, you know, in, in terms of timing, it's, um, uh, you, you have a point you want to make. People need to know a little bit about it to care. So the timing is about the, how much can you put in front of, you have this big scene. How much can you put in front of the scene to explain it so that we know what's at stake, we care, and now we watch it happen, and now we worry about the consequences. So, um, timing is about how much prelude, when you hit with the surprise, the big scene, or the, you know it's coming, you know it's coming, and then it comes uh, like, a, like a big punch or a semi-truck coming down the road. Um, 
So how you do, how you portray that is part of the skill of relaying the moment. It's like a it's like trying to be a good storyteller at the campfire telling scary stories. Um, if you just dove straight into crazy man went in and chopped them all up, everybody goes oh. But if you describe who's in the cabin, all five people, what they did, how they got scared, um, what they did to um, protect the cabin and none of it worked. And one by one, he picked them off. Now you're getting into timing and, and storytelling that people turn the page. But when you're pacing a story, you can pace it too slowly. And you yes. lose your reader. You can take forever. If you stop to talk about who built the cabin and where the wood came from and how all that, it doesn't matter. You know, wandering off into left field or wandering off into tangents, you know. Do you ever wander off into left field? No, I wander <laughs> off to right field. <laughs> so... You do a bit of wandering. I do a bit of wandering. Sometimes I'll find a charming moment, like with Zoe, a character like Zoe, who's supposed to be, was originally supposed to be a supporting character in the horror story, Rachel Rising. Um, but she has so much personality that... I would give her a page just to do something cute so she has a moment. Uh, and it's a lot like a TV show where if somebody is really compelling, you give them a little moment to do an extra character bit. Um, and it really just kind of draws you in more if it works well. Uh, when it doesn't work well is say, for instance, a lawyer is leaving his house and we know that there's trouble waiting for him downtown. But we spend a lot of time leaving the house and looking at his garden that we'll never see again, and he gets into a car we'll never see again, and he listens to a radio station. It doesn't matter what's on the radio, it's not relevant to the attack that's coming. That kind of stuff, you know, you're just wasting your time, you're wasting your reader's time. Everything has to be spot on. If he comes out of his house to get in the car and he checks a mailbox, and you're gonna see that mailbox again in the, in the story, and next time you see it, there's gonna be a plastic bomb underneath it. You know, okay, that was worth showing the mailbox to get it situated in the story. That kind of thing. You just, you want everything to have a, a point. And then you can say, oh, showing that mailbox in, uh, in the first third was um, part of good timing to set it up later. So, that kind of thing. You're just trying to think of the big picture. No wasted. And you have to think about how much you want to devote to... A certain scene or a certain story arc before you start it? Yeah, you do. Um, because, you know, I'm talking about the details of a scene, but even the scene itself, how does it portray against the other 17 scenes that are in this segment? Like this episode of the TV show or this section of the book or this issue, or even in the graphic novel. If you break your graphic novel down to uh, 75 basic scenes, um, well, picture the famous uh, uh, pictures of Walt Disney where he broke down Snow White on the, on the big wall and every major scene was on the wall and all the animators are looking at it and he's saying, do we need that? Does she, do we need to see her go get a bucket of water? Why does it matter? You know, and what can we make important out of that to help the entire big picture. Not just that segment, but everything. So you do kind of think like that, even no matter how small your project is, because it just improves it. Okay, do you have anything else, Mr. Moore? Um, no. Um, what are you drawing today? Today, I thought maybe, you know, I've talked about drawing expressions, uh, which is just kind of, uh, all the generic stuff, the generic expressions like yeah, basic 12 or whatever. But what about emotions? What, are, what, if you, what if you're trying to draw a face that actually not just communicates happy, sad, mad, but actually uh, zings your heart? How do you get that drawing? How do you get that expression? What's that little extra twist on the eyes and the mouth and all that that change it from, oh, sad face to, oh, you know actually get a response out of the reader. The aww, the little puppy response. Just like that? Yeah, aww. Okay. So that's what I'm gonna to try to show today. You're gonna to try to show it or you're going to show it? I'm gonna try, I mean, it hasn't happened yet. And it's my goal in the next 20 minutes is to show you that. 
Uh, let's see how well I do. So, I hope you do well. Thank you, babe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it for me, you crazy kids. All right. <laughs> I hope you have a good week, and we'll see you right back here next Sunday. Okay. Terry is going to do emotions, or he's going to get emotional, one or the other. One or the other, I don't know. <laughs> Meet me here. Here's expression. We're having a heated discussion. I'm right. Are you sure? Maybe I'm not right. So those are the, those are the expressions. You can see your expression soften here as what he said gets starts processing in her brain. When you turn the page, look, it's in her brain now and she realizes a terrible truth about what he said. And although the drawing is so, uh, looks so relaxed, I mean, that's simply a face, a nose and a mouth with the mouth a little bit open. And then those eyes could be on several expressions. You could draw those eyes as simply looking out at the Grand Canyon. But when you put it all together, what you have is what they call the Thousand Yard Stare. And the Thousand Yard Stare is a famous painting from uh, World War II um, where the soldiers that had been in trauma, they called it the Thousand Yard Stare, where they had seen so much that they just couldn't process anymore and they went numb. So here's our basic person, happy. And they smile and it pulls the mouth back and that pulls the, accentuates the cheek. And then how, where you have a point or it doesn't come to a point there. It depends on how broad the cheek is. Okay, there's a smile, right? We all agree that's a smile. Okay. Happy person. And then... Somebody says something a little uh, strange. And it's like, what do you mean by that? And the smile begins to fall a little bit. The corner of the mouth comes down a little bit. Like that. What? And you can just watch the mouth come down to where, what do you mean, right? And then somebody says something really damning, like, it's your fault. Whatever problem we have going on here, the eyebrow pulls in. And you can either keep the mouth closed. You can tell where I'm going with that if it's closed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Or if what they're saying, <clears throat> sorry, if what they're saying it might have some truth to it. See, you don't want to pull that lip straight down like I just had it because then it looks like the muscles are forcing it to do that like a tight-lipped Um you want the, if it's more relaxed, if it's forward, it looks more relaxed. Comes down here, and then there's a drop. Okay, now we're talking. This gets into what I was talking about, about drawing in comics. See the the shadowing starting to build up from the previous ones. And now it looks like she has a mustache, but it's not really there. Um, this is what happens when you draw with pencil and keep erasing over the same thing. So now we've gone from smiling to the middle of the conversation. And suppose she's losing this conversation. 
the other person is right. She really did just blow it. I start with the eye. And I, I first thing I did was pull the um, the eye, the brows together because that's the universal uh, symbol for worry, concern, and then that affects the top of the eye. Which the eye pulls more open. She's paying. You have her full attention, but she's very concerned. And then what happens here is depends on whether she's talking or she's listening and taking her medicine are listening to all the damning, damning evidence. Okay, the way I got the, the prune chin, <laughs> oh, like, you know, the quivering chin, um, is you pull the top lip tight, and the top lip becomes dominant over the bottom lip, like that. Now the bottom lip is is it's like you're biting the bottom lip. You could almost sometimes even do like that. This lip still has muscle right there, and then the chin. So by pulling that extra line right there, you can see the, the definition of the the chin being pulled with the muscles here. And you can reinforce what's happening here by showing just a little bit of increase on the nostrils because your nostrils flare. And when you pull this up a little bit, it shows a flared nostril. Okay, now we're getting into closer to like uh, something smells bad. So you have to be careful with your nostril. It's really more of just a downward pull. See the difference that makes? We went from smell bad to, um, and this is not the right angle now. You want this angle to match the nostril angle. Like that. And then because that mouth is pulled back, there's a cheek here, right? And that is the edge of that cheek. If you were a painter, you would have some, you know, you would be defining this this fatty area as a painter, but you you don't have that luxury. So you just, as a cartoonist, you just use that line, and then there, as a painter, you would have tones in here that make this a little darker than the top lip. Um, but you don't have that as a cartoonist with your pen, so you just go like hopeful to on the verge of tears. And the way you go from here to the On the Verge of Tears now is to introduce the waterworks first in the eye, which means you introduce more white space up here on the pupils. And I didn't touch this yet, but you can increase this and amplify this problem. by joining the eye and the brow. Because as the, eye, as the brow pulls together, it pulls this top of the eye along with it, and that's how you get that one line that I tend to draw. So, the you know, the that's as intense as you can get right there. Now, if you wanted to have more shock to it, you can actually drop this bottom eyelid like that. See the difference that made? It went from, um, there's there's more like a shock or a thousand mile stare shock and crying to like, you know, disbelief, to if you pull that line up, now it's more like I'm in control and I just can't believe you're saying those words to me. You know, like you're really hurting me as opposed to shock. So, um, and then this mouth can get much more intense because right now it's still, by much more intense, I mean it begins to get
on the verge of ugly. Because hard crying is not a track, is not a is not a pretty face. It's just heartbreaking, right? So there, uh, the jaw going slack and revealing some teeth in there, the uh, flat lip, upper lip, the uh, dominant over the bottom lip because the bottom lip is is busy, uh, just relaxing and falling. Corner of the mouth falls, the chin uh, goes into a recess, kind of a receding thing there, even if they have a strong chin. This is a strong chin, but you can see that the line is going this way. It's not going that way. To draw your, your face angle like this is how you draw pride and uh, determination and defiance. To go this way is how you draw um, the opposite emotions. Okay, this is a person now who is devastated. So we've gone from taking somebody who was happy to see you, and within one minute, you have broken their heart and crushed their lives. And that's the difference between drawing expressions and emotions. That is an expression, but it's packed full of emotion. That one has a very simple emotion like, Hi, my name is Derek. Uh, this is... You've, you've just ruined me. So that's the difference. Um, I hope that helps. Um, I, this is kind of, those are the kind of things I think about all day, every day as I'm working on my books. Um, and I hope that it helps you with your drawing. So have fun and I'll talk to you next week.